the episode I saw recently. Why is it that he's always sort of walking with his hands in his pockets, just a variety of jackets, talking to the camera? And he just did there what he usually does, so he waxes lyrical about architecture and the surrounding environment, but then he delivers gloomy predictions about budgets and building materials and timelines before once again waxing lyrical about how stunning and inspiring the finished house really is. Well, I wonder what he'd think of these. Now, I'm not 100% sure what's going on here. Obviously, the house has been uh, inverted, and I'm, uh, from what I read, this is finished. This is the finished product. So, interesting path to the front door, and um, probably not for me. This one, <clears throat> I think, is probably for the introverts amongst us who don't want any visitors at all uh, and would be quite happy never to leave home. It's quite a small home, though, and you would need your boat license. This one. Where is the pool? Like, look at the pool. Where is the, the it's an in-ground, it's an in-cloud pool. This one confuses me. I've, I've, I'll be interested in my uh, brother-in-law Dave's thoughts on this one later. Um, I'm, I just don't know. I don't know what to say. Once again, maybe not someone who's a fan of visitors. I'm, I'm, I'm not sure how you would even get there. And, and you know, while these structures may deserve the title of a grand design, you have to wonder how well they're going to cope with bad weather. Storms, blizzards, tsunamis, and, and of course our friend here in Queensland, the tropical cyclone. We've had, uh, we've had our fair share of cyclones in Gladstone, um, some during my lifetime. The one that's most memorable for me is uh, Tropical Cyclone Marsha. Who remembers Marsha? Who's na that name is just ringing a bell in the back of your mind. Here's the map that, um, of when Marsha came to visit. In 2015, when Marsha came to visit, our son, Zach, was about five and a half years old, and our daughter, Pippa, was a three-week-old newborn baby. So to say I was stressed at the idea of a cyclone bearing down on Gladstone was probably something of an understatement. And I remember that day. You may remember that day as well. I remember the, the weather wasn't too wild in the morning. Zach was even out in the street playing with all his neighbourhood mates because school was cancelled. But as the day wore on, reports started to trickle onto the news of the significant damage that Marsha had done just up the road at Yapoon. And we were told that this Category 4 cyclone was now heading for Gladstone. And the council opened our local evacuation centre, which is at the Entertainment Centre, for anyone's future reference. And, and I remember seeing on the TV, I remember seeing footage of local Gladstone residents going and arriving at the entertainment centre to take refuge. Should we go? We talked about it and we decided to stay at home. You know, our house was well prepared. We don't live in an exposed area and the thought of going to the entertainment centre with a three-week-old baby and a five-year-old was not very appealing. But it was a long night, and I remember sitting up in the night, feeding Pippa, listening to the wind howl around the house, and the rain pour down. And the next morning, we woke up and discovered that Marsha had somehow largely gone around Gladstone, and we had been spared its full force, for which we were all very grateful. Other communities were not quite so lucky. So, for decades now, 
any homes or, or structures that are built in North Queensland have to be built to withstand a Category 4 cyclone. And, and the building methods that builders use to ensure this include concrete and steel, reinforced, like masonry block walls. There's all these rules around how deep the footings have to be. There's pages of regulations about roofs and garage doors and sheds. And communities also need to have an evacuation centre that's built to those standards where local residents can go and take refuge from cyclones. Well, this sermon series we're starting today is called Grand Designs, and we're going to be taking a look at some of Jesus' parables about buildings. They might not be the first topic of parables that springs to your mind, but they're there. And the way that these buildings can represent our spiritual growth. As Jesus followers, we're aiming to become more like Jesus. And to do this, we need to build our lives on rock and not sand. So our governments have laid down many, many rules about how physical structures must be built to keep us safe in times of natural disaster. Well, today we're going to hear from Jesus and about how we can ensure that our lives stand firm in times of personal disaster. Because personal disaster will come in this life. That is a guarantee. So in your Bibles, let's take a look at Luke chapter 6, verses 46 to 49. And this is Jesus speaking. Why do you call me Lord, Lord? and not do what I tell you. Everyone who comes to me and hears my words and does them, I will show you what he is like. He is like a man building a house who dug deep and laid the foundation on the rock. And then a flood arose. The stream broke against that house and could not shake it because it had been well built. But the one who hears and does not do them is like a man who built a house on the ground without a foundation. When the stream broke against it, immediately it fell. And the ruin of that house was great. These Blunt, let's say it, these blunt words from Jesus come at the end of his Sermon on the Plain, which is also found in Matthew chapter 7 as the Sermon on the Mount. And this is a pretty radical sermon that sounds really simple on the surface, but takes a lot of hard work to apply to a life. It's a description of how you can build a Christian life. And it's all about integrity and perseverance an attitude. So, so far in his Sermon on the Plain, you know, Jesus has covered our attitudes to life circumstances and the need to trust God in those circumstances. He's covered our attitude to others and the need to love them. He's covered our attitude to ourselves and the need to be painfully honest with ourselves. And now here, in our passage today, at the end of his sermon, finally he addresses our attitude to God and the need for obedience. Jesus finishes his sermon with this, we must hear and do God's word. Now, many of us are familiar with this parable from our childhood, Maybe more so the Matthew version, which describes the two men in this parable as one being wise and one being foolish. Some of you may be quietly humming, the wise man built his house upon the rock, to yourselves now. If you weren't already, you can thank me later. But I read this and I think, well, what makes that man wise? 
And what makes the other guy foolish? And it's tempting to give the, the, maybe the Sunday school answer, certainly when I was at Sunday school, which is, well, the wise man's a Christian and the foolish man is not. But I don't think that's what Jesus is highlighting here. And besides, Christians can still be foolish sometimes. So what does the wise man do? Let's take a look at verse 47. The wise man, it says, he comes to Jesus, he hears his words, and he does them. What does the other guy, the foolish man, do? He comes to Jesus, he hears his words, but he does not obey them. So the difference between the wise man and the foolish man is simply obedience to Jesus. Simply, ha ha. So I think the question has to be asked of us this morning, are we wise or are we foolish? Okay, let's look at the things the wise man does. He comes to Jesus. Well, many of us here came to Jesus in faith and repentance a long time ago. Many of us here come to Jesus each day in prayer, seeking to learn, asking for our daily bread that we know we need to sustain us in the decisions and the interactions and the situations that we're going to face each day. But if you are yet to come to Jesus, perhaps today is the day. What about hearing his words? Well, many of us hear Jesus' words here in this place and and in other places too. Many of us don't just hear, but we try to listen with understanding. Many of us approach our Bible or times of teaching ready to learn. We don't abandon this wonderful thing, God's Word, that He's given to us to help us weather life's storms. But if you are yet to hear Jesus' words, perhaps today is the day. But as Jesus points out to his disciples, to his disciples, the foolish man does these things too. He comes. He hears. But crucially, he does not obey. And Jesus laments this fact. At the start of this parable, he says, why do you call me Lord, Lord, and not do what I tell you? How is your obedience? That's a thorny question. Are you obeying Jesus' words? Putting his teaching into practice in your relationships? in your work, in your service, in our community. If you're not sure what this teaching is, read the Sermon on the Plain in Luke chapter 6 and see. Because Jesus tells us today that obedience to him leads to stronger life foundations that will endure. He says that obedience provides protection in the storm. He says that true discipleship is following him and obeying him, seeing the world through his eyes, trying to act as he did. It is not adherence to the latest doctrine or having great confidence in how good your own biblical theology might be, you could say that Jesus' love language is obedience. If you are yet to obey Jesus, perhaps today is the day. So what kind of life are you building? 
an unstable structure with no foundation, or a strong refuge? Are you building to last? Or are you building to be destroyed? Jesus warns us not to trust in our own understanding here. Foolish people think that their building is strong enough to weather a storm. We need to test the foundation on which we plan to build our lives because a crisis, those times of personal disaster, will reveal and test your foundations like nothing else. So how do you build a house? That is a life that cannot be shaken. Jesus gives us three steps. He is like a man building a house who dug deep and laid the foundation on the rock. So step one, dig deep. Sometimes a building's foundations have to be deeper than expected. Now my expert builder, brother-in-law Dave, sitting here, I would just like to note that my husband, who is Dave's brother, queried my use of the term expert, but I am standing by it. So my expert builder, brother-in-law Dave, who provided top-notch building advice when I was preparing this sermon, he tells me that the required depth of a building's foundation is dependent on two things. Number one, the quality of the soil. Number two, the wind rating of the building site. If the soil is reactive rather than neutral, foundations have to be deeper. If winds are high in that area, foundations have to be deeper. Now, digging deep is messy and it takes a lot of time and effort. What's the soil of your heart like? Is it reactive or is it neutral? I would hazard a guess that many of us have hearts and minds that are reactive. We have bad habits. We have deep-rooted sins. We have rocks or obstructions that stop us from making spiritual progress in our walk with Jesus. Jesus says, dig deep. Dig out those bad habits. Get rid of habitual sin. Remove the rocks that block your progress and do this in his power, not your own. How strong are the winds in your life right now? How strong have they been in the past? I'm sure we've all had times where we feel like we're living through a gale, being buffeted on all sides, pushing against incredibly strong winds. Jesus says, dig deep. It's what's under the surface appearance that counts the most. Take the time to do this deep digging so that your foundation can be laid on healthy soil and can withstand a gale. And remember, and I need to remember this too, this digging may be something that you have to return to many times throughout your life. Step two, lay the foundation but Jesus tells us what the foundation needs to be, the rock. Jesus is the rock, the word of God, and he is the best foundation for a life. Anything else is a shifting foundation, or even worse, like the fellow in this parable today, no foundation at all, which simply invites destruction. Obedience to Jesus' words lays an unshakable foundation. So if Jesus is the foundation of your life, praise him again today for rescuing you. Remember what you were and where you were and how you were before your salvation and thank him for the work that he has begun in your life. 
If Jesus is not the foundation of your life, perhaps today is the day to lay your foundation on him. Now, there, there could be holes in the soil of your heart left over from digging out those things that held you captive, those sins and those habits and those blockages. Ask Holy Spirit to fill those holes with Jesus, with his love, and love him and learn from him and walk with him. Meet with God often, meet with other believers, read his word, pray and give and serve. But let's remember that none of us are perfect. We are all buildings with mixed foundations this side of heaven. But as we become more like Christ, the process known as sanctification, God is strengthening our good foundations. He who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion in the day of Christ Jesus. And step three, build the house. Build your life. Invest in healthy relationships that bring blessings to you and to others. Work, whether paid or unpaid in this world. Use the gifts and passions God has given you to contribute to our community and to our nation. Serve God's people. Play your part in God's kingdom here in this place. And give of your time and your money and your energy so that others may hear the good news that they're loved by God. Build your life. In the words of Paul, be alert, stand firm in the faith, be brave, be strong. Let all that you do be done in love. What cyclone rating would your life have right now? Perhaps you can see storm clouds gathering on the horizon. Perhaps you're in a storm right now. Maybe you have sunny skies. Wherever you are right now, Jesus tells you, that obedience to him is the key to surviving the storms of this life. You can stand firm because your life is founded on him and not on your own strength. Let's be like the wise man. Everyone who comes to me and hears my words and does them. I will show you what he is like. He is like a man building a house who dug deep and laid the foundation on the rock and then a flood arose. The stream broke against that house and could not shake it because it had been well built. Let's pray. Lord, each of us are building a life And Lord, we want to build our lives on the foundation that will endure through every crisis, through every disaster, through every storm. Show us, Lord, where our foundation or the soil needs work. Holy Spirit, empower us to do the work that needs to be done and to trust you, Lord that you who have begun a good work in each one of us will bring it to completion. Help us to obey. Amen.